Hey, happy Thursday. We're going to talk about the second half of the Civil War today. And uh, I'll talk about financing the war because we didn't really talk about that much last time. Um, first of all, the Union, uh, and that's the United States government, it's got a pretty sound economic base. It's got an established currency. Everybody knows what the dollar is, what it's worth all around the world. Uh, so the United States, as far as it goes with financing the war, is doing pretty well. Um, the one thing that the United States government is going to do is it passes something called the Legal Tender Act. And what that's going to do, it allows the government to print greenbacks. You probably have a greenback in your pocket right now that's better known as a dollar today. Now the greenbacks, they're legal tender currency immediately, meaning as soon as the government gives you a greenback, you can go spend it. That's not how it was in the South, though. Um, in the South, the Confederacy, they have to create an economy from scratch. Um, there's very little economic base, as you saw. There's very little manufacturing. It's all about um, agriculture. And one of the very first things that the Confederacy does is in August of 1861, they pass an income tax. Another thing that happens is they print their own bills, their own treasury bills, their own treasury notes, if you will. However, these Confederate dollars, they aren't redeemable until two years after the end of the war. Now that's pretty risky if you think about it, because if you have a Confederate dollar, the only way to guarantee that you're going to get something from it is if the Confederacy wins the war. And even then, you have to wait two years. Now the Confederate government's going to print money and individual states are going to print money. So there's paper money flowing everywhere and it's basically worth the same amount as the paper I'm reading off of right now. Now all of this paper money being printed, it's going to cause massive inflation. Uh, for example, by the end of the war, prices have risen 90 times the pre-war level. And even as early as 1863, uh, prices have raised 70%. So it's, it's pretty rough if you're in the South. Uh, there are wage riots, there's food riots, there's runaway inflation. Um, yeah. Now, diplomacy. If you remember from Tuesday, one of the ways that the Confederacy thought that they could win the war is to get recognition. And they wanted to get recognition from primarily three countries, Britain, France, and the Soviet Union. Well, actually, they weren't Soviet Union yet, they were just Russia. So they wanted to get control from Britain, France, and Russia. And the one thing that the Confederacy had was cotton, and they were going to try to use cotton to their advantage. So what the Confederacy does is they stop selling cotton to France, they stop selling cotton to England. And you might say, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. Well, hear me out. What the South wanted to do was withhold the cotton until France and Britain were basically begging them for it. Uh, both England and France very much depended on southern cotton for their textile mills. Well, it didn't quite work that way because during the 1850s the South had grown so much cotton that there were warehouses stuffed full of it, both in Europe and the United States. And when Europe finally did need cotton, they didn't need southern cotton anymore. They went to India to use it, and they went to Egypt to use it. So this one trump card that the Confederacy had, this idea of cotton, um, it's, it's a disaster. It, it doesn't do what they wanted to do. So uh, the Confederacy does not win recognition through cotton. Well, then they look at it with money. They say, the blockade is going to keep us from buying stuff from you, and you could be a very good partner with us. We could make you a lot of money if you helped us sell th things to us and buy things from you, blah, blah, blah. Well, Britain especially says, that's nice, but we are getting plenty of money from the Union, so eh, if you can get to us, we'll sell stuff to you, but we don't really need you. So pretty much every diplomatic effort to get recognized fails. Britain, they didn't really want to fight the United States. France and Russia, they didn't really want to fight the United States. Um, the Confederates do get some supplies from Europe, but it's not nearly enough. We also have this need for men. If you remember from Tuesday, I said that most states only ask for people to sign up for 90 days, six months, maybe a year. 
Well, it's obvious by 1861, the end of it, that this is going to be a long war. So by 1862, especially in the Confederacy, those initial volunteer enlistments are up and not everybody wants to re-sign with the military. Um, in the Confederacy, you get more re-enlistments than you do in the North, but there's issues with getting people in both the North and the South. Uh, for example, in the Union, Lincoln's going to ask state governors to send more volunteers and the state governors have trouble getting volunteers. So both the North and the South are going to pass conscription. Conscription is basically a forced draft. If your name is called, if your number is called, you have to go to the military. Uh, in the South, a lot of people resist conscription. And in the North, you have riots, especially in New York City, against conscription. Now, one unique thing about the North is there is this idea of being able to pay a substitute. Basically, if you had the money, you could have a poor person take your place on the battlefield. And for many, uh, the Confederacy and the Union, this is going to become a rich man's war, a poor man's fight, because the rich pay the poor to take their places. All right, we've got some political movements because politics are always involved in history. It, for the Union, uh, during the first year of the war, Lincoln, he's going to avoid pretty much every serious issue. Uh, it's not going to be until 1862, early, early 1863, that there's this uh, movement against Abraham Lincoln. And this movement becomes known as the Copperhead Movement. Um, it happens because the war casualties are starting to mount, people are starting to get tired of war. Uh, the best example of the Copperhead movement, you could almost call him the leader of it, is Clement Vallandigham. Uh, Clement Vallandigham, he announces, uh, first of all, he is a representative from Ohio, serving in the U.S. Congress. He's going to declare his candidacy in 1863 to become the governor of Ohio. He's going to be an anti-war governor. He pledges to take Ohio out of the war, actually. Well, Lincoln is going to appoint a military commander for Ohio, this guy named Ambrose Burnside. And I wish I had a picture of him up. I tried to fit him on the slide, but I couldn't do it. And I don't know the software enough to pull up a picture for him. But do me a favor. I'll count to 10 while you do this. Just pull out your phone and look up a picture of Ambrose Burnside. I want you to see his beautiful mutton chop sideburns. Okay, that's been about 10 seconds. I really hope you looked up Ambrose Burnside because his mutton chops are to die for. Um, his, he was so known for his mutton chops that sideburns are named after Ambrose Burnside. All right, so continuing on, uh, Burnside is going to arrest Vallandigham, charge him with treason and sedition, meaning talking against the government. Uh, he's accused of being a Confederate spy, basically, and he is sent to the Confederacy. The Confederacy pretty much asks him, why are you here? You're not one of us. And Vlandigan says, I don't know. And the Confederacy sends him to Canada. And guess what? While he's in Canada, he continues his campaign for governor of Ohio. I mean, he, and he ultimately loses, but it's still a kind of a cool story. Now for the Confederacy, when we get to 1862, there's a peace movement that breaks out, uh, especially in eastern Tennessee, western North Carolina, northern Georgia, northern Alabama. Basically, the southern Appalachians are going to have a peace movement. They're going to be anti-war. And to tell the truth, that those parts of the South were never truly for the war because they didn't have slaves. Um, there is actually a regiment from Tennessee that joins the Union and actively fights against the Confederacy. And you end up with a lot of soldiers beginning to abandon the Confederate Army. They, they're they um, losing faith in the cause. They are scared of the casualties. There are many, many different reasons. They want to go home and take care of their families. But the Confederate Army, uh, starting in late 1862, early 1863, starts to bleed men from the Army. 
All right, Southern women are going to play a big role in this. Uh, women in the South, they're expected to show their support for the war no matter what, while keeping within their gender roles. So they're expected to show support for the war. They're expected to sacrifice their men for the army, their sons, their husbands, their fathers. At the same time, they're expected to provide equipment and clothing for the men at war. They're supposed to give the men spiritual guidance, you know, the write letters telling them to keep the faith. And they're also supposed to write letters to provide moral support. And uh, all the while supporting their families while the men are off fighting. Now, very often, um, what these women want in return, uh, they want assistance meeting their needs, they want protection from enemy attacks, and they want information from their, their loved ones at the, the front fighting. Well, they don't get that. So when women uh, don't get the support they're asking for and the help they're asking for, they begin to uh, actively work against the, the Confederate government. Women stop supporting the war. Uh, women start um, urging soldiers not to re-enlist. Women start ur urging soldiers to desert and come home. Um, the women start helping escaped prisoners and women start food riots because they can't eat and they can't provide for their families. Even more than that, you start to get women moving outside their traditional roles. Uh, this is when you start to get predominantly women in nursing, you start to get women working in factories, women become the teachers. Um, all of that is going to be a change that's begun by the Civil War. All right, we also have to talk about the Emancipation Proclamation, and there's a, a, a picture of the original Emancipation there. Um, by 1863, slavery had been abolished in a couple of states. Maryland, Missouri, Louisiana, and Arkansas have all gotten rid of slavery even before the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, Lincoln is going to issue the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1st, 1863. Now, a lot of you have all probably heard that the Emancipation Proclamation ended slavery, but that is just false. And if you are a, a Lincoln fanboy, I apologize. It's just not true. Uh, first of all, the government, it worked to abolish slavery, but it never had a plan on what to do or how to do it. Um, the Emancipation Proclamation, it's, if you read it, which you're supposed to do for this week, but when you do read it, if you haven't already, pay attention. There's a whole bunch of places that are excluded. There are a whole bunch of places where the Emancipation Proclamation does not go into effect. And those are all places the, can, the Union Army already controls. So if you were a slave living in the Union, or if you were a slave living in Union-controlled territory, the Emancipation Proclamation did nothing for you. The Emancipation Proclamation was only for people who were in areas of the Confederacy that were still held by the Confederacy. Now think about that for a minute. It's completely unenforceable. Lincoln had no say over the Confederacy. Slave owners aren't going to set their slaves free, and even if slave owners did set their slaves free, the next slave owner down the street is going to take them. So what was the Emancipation Proclamation for then? Truthfully, while it is a great document and it sets things in motion, ultimately it's just a political document. Lincoln issues the Emancipation Proclamation, number one, to get support for the war because he was losing it, to give the war a cause other than just preserving the Union, and it was also a tool to get Lincoln reelected. That hurt some people, but Lincoln ultimately, he was a politician and he needed votes. All right, before I move on, uh, this is a good place for your word of the day. The word of the day is flower, F-L-O-W-E-R. That's because I planted flowers today before it rains and blows all the seed away. All right, let's look at what's going on with the late Civil War. What do you need to know about the end of the Civil War? Uh, I'm going to try to keep it from being a military history class because for a lot of people that's boring. So I'm just going to kind of give you the rundown here. Uh, first of all, you have the battles of Vicksburg and Gettysburg. They happen at almost the same time. Uh, Vicksburg is a city in Mississippi. It's right on the Mississippi River. And by 1863, it is the last city in control of the Confederates connecting the Western Confederacy to the Eastern Confederacy. 
this is very important because Arkansas and Texas and places to the west is where the Confederacy got their horses from. And if there is any advantage the Confederate Army had over the Union Army, it was its use of cavalry. To have cavalry, you have to have horses. So uh, to make it short, um, Ulysses S. Grant, he is going to attack Vicksburg. He starts to surround the city of Vicksburg. He disappears. The Confederates don't know where he is. And then suddenly he reappears um, at the end of May. He surrounds the city and basically squeezes the life out of the city. Uh, no goods can come in. Nothing can go out. And by July 4th of 1863, the 35,000 Confederate soldiers that were defending the city of Vicksburg are forced to surrender. And just a little interesting note, the guy in charge of the Confederate army in Vicksburg was named John Pemberton. And he is related to the Pemberton who created Coca-Cola. A very famous quote by Abraham Lincoln after the Battle of Vicksburg, the father of all waters now runs unvexed to the sea. In other words, the, the entire Mississippi River is controlled by the Union. Gettysburg, pretty famous. Uh, it's a three-day battle located in southern Pennsylvania. It goes from July 1st to July 3rd, 1863. Uh, Robert E. Lee decides to move north into Pennsylvania. He's hoping to take some pressure off of Virginia. And the Union Army and the Confederate Army, they're going to meet near Gettysburg. Uh, it was completely unexpected. Uh, day one is going to be the uh, Southern Cavalry versus the Northern Infantry. The Union Army is going to be defeated. The Southern Army actually has a bigger army there. The, the Confederates have about 27,000 men. The Union has about 22,000. And um, the Confederacy, they're able to push back the Union. The Union troops are going to retreat to high ground, and they're going to call it a day. On the second day of battle, it's a little bit different story. Um, General Lee, he gets intelligence based on um, where the Union Army is and what they're doing and what to expect. And the intelligence that Robert E. Lee gets is incorrect. Uh, Robert E. Lee does not realize that reinforcements have appeared and Robert E. Lee, he orders a general assault, a general assault to attack the Union Army. The day two, um, the two armies are locked in battle pretty much all day. It gets to the point that it's hand-to-hand -hand combat. And um, on day two, the the Confederates and the Union, they basically fight to a draw, but I call it a Confederate defeat because they don't achieve their goal. So now day three is even worse than day two. Um, more incorrect intelligence is gotten. A general is late to the battle, so Lee doesn't have the troops and the supplies he thinks he's supposed to have. Uh, there's a general assault again, and the Confederates actually break through the line this time, but they can't press their advantage. And the Confederates who break through the Union lines are surrounded and then all rounded up. So ultimately, Gettysburg is going to be a disaster for all. Uh, Robert E. Lee in the South, the casualties are over 26,000. The Union losses are about 23,000. And a lot of people consider Vicksburg and Gettysburg the second turning point in the war. This is when the Confederacy starts their their um, long, slow uh, slide into defeat. The Atlanta campaign is pretty important to us around here. Um, we all know about General Sherman. Um, you've heard of him at least. Uh, the army led by General Sherman, he's got more than 100,000 soldiers at his um, disposal. The Confederate Army, led by Joseph E. Johnston, only has 60,000 soldiers. And both Sherman's army and Johnston's army are going to fight along what is today basically Interstate 75 between Chattanooga and Atlanta. So they, they have to stay along the railroad 
because that's how both sides were getting their supplies. And the railroad goes right along I-75. So there's a battle in places like East Ridge, there's a battle in Ringgold, there's a battle in Dalton, Risaka, Tunnel Hill, Rocky Face, and finally they get to Kennesaw Mountain. Uh, Kennesaw Mountain is kind of the uh, last ditch effort to, to stop Sherman's army and save Atlanta. And on June 27th of 1864, the Union Army is stopped at Kennesaw Mountain, um, at least for a time. Uh, General Sherman is eventually going to order his men to go around Kennesaw, and once Johnston realizes that he is being uh, surrounded, he orders a retreat back to the city of Atlanta. Now, once Johnston gets to Atlanta, the Confederate government replaces Johnston with a guy named John Bell Hood. They think John Bell Hood is going to be a better general. All they know is that Johnston has retreated over and over and over again. Well, J uh, John Bell Hood has three battles. There's a battle on July 20th, July 22nd, and July 28th. In those three battles, um, General Hood loses 13,000 men to the Union Army. That's more men than Johnston lost in three months of fighting. So. Hood is very quickly fired and Johnston is put back in charge. Now what about the burning of Atlanta? Well, you might have said, well, Sherman burned down Atlanta. It's not actually true. The Confederates burned Atlanta before they abandoned it. Now Sherman doesn't help to put out the fires, but um, he didn't start. All right, another important thing that you might have heard of is the March to the Sea by Sherman. A very famous quote by him, war is cruelty and you cannot refine it. Uh, basically, Sherman realizes that you can't just do a material war, you have to do a war of the hearts and minds as well. So Sherman, he comes up with this plan to defeat the South, its will to fight, and its resistance. And to do this, Sherman is going to march his army from Atlanta to Savannah. They're going to live off the land, they're going to destroy everything in sight, and um, He's supposed to buy everything from the people. Right? When, he, when he's living off the land, he means that he's going to buy supplies from the people he finds. But unfortunately, people took it out of context and his own troops started to burn stuff down. Uh, once again, Sherman didn't stop it, but he didn't order it either. So this march to the sea, it's going to be 60,000 men. They're going to march in a path about 60 miles wide and they're going to go 285 miles to Savannah. Uh, it begins on November 15th. You got one column of men that move down what is today I-75. They, they go through uh, um, Jonesboro. They go through through Barnesville. They go through Forsyth. They go to Macon, and then they go over to Dublin. There's a second column that moves east towards Decatur. They go out uh, what is today I-20. They get to Madison. Then they turn south. They go to Milledgeville, which is at that time the state capital, and then they meet up in Dublin. Now once these two columns meet in Dublin, they start marching southwest to Savannah. Uh, Sherman's army is going to arrive in Savannah on December 20th, 1864. Sherman offers the city of Savannah to Abraham Lincoln as a Christmas present, and Sherman's also going to have a huge flock of slaves behind him. It's estimated that at one point there were 25,000 black slaves who joined the army as it moved towards Savannah. Unfortunately, only about 7,000 of those 25,000 former slaves actually make it to Savannah because the army just they can't take care of that many people. So there's a lot of starvation, there's a lot of disease, and a lot of people die. Now the end of the war, you got to go back to Virginia. You got General Lee and General Grant who are battling each other in Virginia. Uh, Ulysses S. Grant is going to chase Robert E. Lee throughout Virginia. Basically, wherever Lee goes, Grant follows. But Grant can never catch him. Uh, one of the important final battles that happens in Virginia is the siege of Petersburg. Petersburg is a suburb of of uh, Richmond, the southern capital. Petersburg is a railroad hub. It's where a bunch of different railroads come together and that's where Richmond got its supplies. 
And this battle is going to go from June 9th of 1864 all the way to March 25th of 1865. Uh, some unique things about this battle, it's one of the earliest uses of trench warfare. And trench warfare is going to be used all over the place in World War I. Um, and there's this event known as the Crater. On July 30th, 1864, 8,000 pounds of explosives are set off underground. Uh, the Union had tunneled underneath the Confederate Army and they set off 8,000 pounds of explosives and killed a bunch of people. Um, but it didn't really do a whole lot in the bigger scheme of things. Um, eventually, Petersburg is going to be defeated. Lee has to retreat. The Confederate government has to leave Richmond and they go on the run and uh, Lee's finally surrounded near Appomattox Courthouse uh, which is in um, southwestern Virginia. Uh, Lee's finally going to surrender to Grant on April 9th and then Joseph E. Johnston is going to surrender to Sherman on April 26th of 1865. And just uh, one other interesting neat, neat thing, one of the final battles of the Civil War actually happens in Columbus, Georgia. Uh, the other interesting thing is the final surrender of the Civil War doesn't happen until November 6th of 1865. There's a ship called the CSS Shenandoah. It goes all the way to Liverpool, England, and it surrenders to the English. And last but not least, um, President Lincoln's going to be assassinated by John Wilkes Booth on April 14th, 1865. So Lincoln is actually dead before the war is over. All right, so um, just a couple words. Um, we'll have one more video on Tuesday, and that will be the last video. I'm going to cover Reconstruction on that day. Um, I'm going to put up the final exam on Monday, but please don't take it until after the next video. Um, I'm just putting it up because we've been told to put it up for an entire week. But don't take it until Tuesday because there's going to be some information you need for it on, um, in Tuesday's video. Uh, keep working on your SLO if you still need to do it. Um, I know one of your one class, the uh, Carrollton class, your SLO has already been done. But the Douglasville class, yours is going to be due this week. So keep working on it. Everybody needs to keep working on your museum review and start studying for the final exam. It's going to be based on the the notes we've done um, a few weeks worth of notes before the the shutdown and then um, you know these videos that I've been putting out for the, for the last couple weeks all right well until uh, next week stay safe we're supposed to have some bad weather tonight so uh, keep an eye out on that and uh, we'll see you soon bye bye